we've been uh, discussing the seventh day. Um, so we've been go- going through the first three chapters of Genesis, Genesis 1, uh, 2, and 3. Uh, we've kind of completed Genesis chapter 1 for the most part. This is the final theme in, in this module, Genesis 1 module. Uh, but we've done a lot of this. I, I plan on next class, kind of starting the class to review just very quickly this uh, before we j- jump into Genesis 2. So next week, what I'd like you to do is read Genesis 2, uh, kind of uh, look at it, research it, um, just jot down your thoughts, things that you come to mind, and we'll just spend the whole class basically just studying Genesis chapter 2. Today, we're going to finish up uh, the seventh day, which um, is, is um, the last day of the creation story, and it really goes with the first chapter, even though it's in chapter 2, the person who made that mark didn't know what he's doing. Um, and so we're going to finish that up. The last, last week we talked about how the seventh day um, and the whole really creation cycle on the first uh, page of the Bible is a, is a temple story. Um, it's God building his temple. Um, it's the cosmic temple. And we saw how the cosmic temple has a lot of um, um, how the tabernacle that he would later, later build in Exodus is based a lot on the cosmic temple um, and different things like that. And and how God coming to rest in his creation and his temple is very key because if he doesn't do that, then the world would just be an empty temple. And what good is an empty temple? Today, we're going to talk about probably the main theme that comes from Genesis 7 and, and or the day seven, and the thing that over and over you'll see throughout the Bible. So we're going to study the theme of rest, kind of like we did with the waters um, a few uh, weeks ago, the waters of chaos and waters of life. We're going to follow the theme of rest throughout uh, the Bible. So let's just read the seventh day, and then we'll work from there. So uh, Genesis chapter 2, verse 2 and 3, on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. Last time we kind of went over this, and we picked out several things um, about it, um, some, some really cool things about him blessing it and making it holy, making it special. But the place that we kind of left off uh, last time was on this word rest. And what does this word rest mean? And I'll turn it back over to y'all. Uh, what does it mean in Genesis chapter uh, 2, and verses 2 and 3, that God rested? Yeah, so he had ceased his creation. He had finished um, that part of it. Good. Any other kind of thoughts? Does it mean that God kind of just took a vacation? Or does it mean that God stopped working? No. Why? Why would we know that? Does God work today? Yeah, so if he if he had ceased from all of his work, then he is still doing work today, so was he ceasing? And I think part of it is, like you said, he's ceasing from creation. But um, I, I, I would suggest, I really like how uh, John Walton uh, kind of put it. He says, thinking of God, think of God taking, uh, as think of God uh, when he rested as taking up his residence in the temple, Sort of like the president when he takes up his residence in the White House. He doesn't reside there to put his feet up and relax, but to begin to do the work of ruling. And that work can begin. Um, God isn't taking a, a vacation. Rest is something that takes place after the crisis has been reverted and stability has been achieved. They would have even known this more back in that day because... They didn't have elections, so who determined who was in charge? Well, you killed the other person that wanted to, to, to take over. And so after doing your, your job of trying to conquest, the, the work of conquest is done, you can rest from that work, you can reside in your 
palace, your temple, and the real work of ruling can begin. And so I think that's what's kind of happening here in Genesis 2 is, is he's taking a rest from the work of creating and now he, the normal day-to-day life can begin. Josh, do something. Yeah, he was, he was, and he over and over called it good uh, and very good. So um, there, there's a, a several uh, examples of this um, in the Old Testament. So in 2 Samuel 7, this is talking about David. Now, when the king lived in his house and the Lord had given him rest from all his surrounding enemies. Um, so David, first part of his reign, I mean, he's battling everyone, everyone in sight. But after that had happened, he can then send his palace and that doesn't mean that he suddenly doesn't do all any work. That just means he can do the normal to normal day life stuff. Um, Deuteronomy 12, this is talking about before they go into the land of promise. But when you go over to the Jordan and live in the land that the Lord God is giving you to inherit, and when he gives you rest from all your enemies around so that you live in safety. So when you go in and you inherit it, and then you conquer all of them, and then you have a rest from conquering, um, you can have a rest. And J- Joshua is sort of like that. A long time afterward, when the Lord has given you rest to Israel from all their surrounding enemies. So you kind of have this idea of rest not being a vacation or a cease from all work, but of kind of the work um, in which they solve the crises and is now they can go about their normal to normal day lives. Um, these specific passages afterwards that I talk about, you can uh, plant vineyards and your houses are already made and uh, you can just go about and give any marriage and being gave in marriage and all that kind of stuff. So does that kind of make sense? Yeah? Okay. A uh, modern example would be unpacking a house. So, you, you know, if you've ever moved, when you first get there, it's just a house and there's just boxes but once you go through the work of unpacking it, it feels like a home. And then you can actually rest in it. It doesn't mean like you suddenly cease from all work. It just means that the day-to-day activities can begin and you can start doing that stuff. So this is what God is doing. Is he is, um, he's done with making creation. Um, and this is kind of uh, alongside all the other Um, gods that would have to battle a bunch of gods to make creation. Here, God doesn't have to do that, but instead he makes it, and then he can preside over the day-to-day activities of creation. Um, And I would also add, so let me go back to this. What is different from day seven, at the end of day seven, that is different from all the other six days of creation? Okay, made the day holy. What what is lacking in this one that is in every other um, day of creation? Good. You could kind of say the blessing would is the same thing, but yeah. What else? Okay. So you could say he didn't create anything. He, he kind of did, in a way, with creating the seventh day. I mean, it's not a material thing, but he kind of did. Um, but there's something at the very end, the very end of almost every single time. Yeah, there's evening and morning of the first day, second day. So there was a conclusion to every day. There's none of that with this one. What theological conclusion can you bring to that? Yeah, everything was good, and it never ended. Yeah, it never ended. We're still living in the seventh day. Um, the, it was a perpetual day that, that never ended. There's no evening and morning. There wasn't conclusion to it. Um, and, and so, like, we are supposed to have this perpetual rest. This is what God intended. This is what he created in the garden. This, this place of perpetual rest. So what happened to this idea and the concept of perpetual rest? You know, do you feel necessarily very restful right now? <laughs> Relaxed? So what, what happened to it? Not very fun. Sin, yeah. So uh, Genesis chapter 3, uh, we haven't got there, but in, in 
uh, when he, specifically when he curses Adam, you, you kind of see that part of the curse is that he will have painful toil um, and that your the days of your life it'll, um, and the ground is going to bruise thorns and thistles for you. You will, by the sweat of your brow, you will eat the food until it returns to the ground since you are taken from dust and to dust you return. Basically, he says part of the curse, and specifically Adam, but I think both, both Adam and Eve, um, is now you had this life of ease where you didn't really need to work for your substance. I mean, if they wanted food, where did they have to go? In the garden. They just had to go to a tree and eat it. Like, it, it didn't take a whole lot. But now they actually have to work for their substance. They have to toil. They have to labor. And it was basically you have to labor all your life until finally you die and you return to the dust that you create. Not a very bright thing. And so what, what we're going to study the rest of the night is God seeking to bring this rest back to creation, back to mankind once again. Um, and we're going to see several ways that he tries to, to do this. Um, I'll stop here. Any, any questions so far? Any comments? Okay, cool. So when is, so this is for you Bible geeks, I guess. Um, when is the next time um, that rest is used um, in the Bible? I'll give you a hint. It's a man's name. It's Noah. So Noah means rest. He literally means rest. Um, so, and uh, this is Genesis chapter 5. It says, when Lamech lived 182 years, he had a son, and he named him Noah. And he said, he will comfort us in the labor and painful toil of our hands that caused by the ground the Lord has cursed. And so you can see how this is a, this kind of takes the two things we noticed that the seventh day perpetual rest and um, combines it with the work that has went against that because of the curse of sin and this expectation that Noah, whose name means rest, is going to free him, uh, free the land from this. Um, and of course, like what, what happens to Noah, um, he, it's the whole, um, it's the whole uh, story of the flood. Um, he, Man was evil, man was horrible, he got washed away, um, except for Noah. And there's all these scenes of decreation and recreation that we've kind of talked about. Um, you have these scenes of God taking away the blessings slowly, day by day, uh, corresponding to the days of creation, and then reversing that and bringing those back up. Um, even to the point where he says he spent his spirit over the waters, and he um, again, uh, made the waters to their own places once again. Um, and then you have this, this um, thing in Genesis chapter 8, verse 21, verse 22. The Lord smelled the pleasing aroma. This is after the ark, and they got off the ark, and he's offered a sacrifice, and said in his heart, never again will I curse the ground because of humans, even though every inclination of the human heart is evil from childhood. And never again will I destroy all living creatures as I have done. As long as the earth endures and seed time and harvest, cold, heat, summer, winter, night and day will never cease. So he says, I will never again curse the, gr the ground uh, because of what has transpired. So in a way, Noah did give rest, but it didn't last long. Because what happens right after this? He says, um, and you have this, this, this whole story of man. It, and this is a, like the fourth fall narrative. So this is a replay of Adam and Eve's sin. Um, because you have a sin with the fruit of the garden um, and nakedness. All, it's the same story. Just replayed with Noah and his, um, and his son Ham. Um, and so you have another fall narrative. And so... Even though he cleansed the world from all the sin, and so you can have your rest, it doesn't last long because man still sins. Does that make sense? Any questions with that? 
still seeking our, our forever rest? Yep. Yep, we'll get there. So that's, that's where we're heading. So if you keep that in mind, you'll be able to go. Okay. So um, the next place we'll go is the Sabbath. I think that's the main one that people get from this. Um, so in Exodus chapter 16, um, so I don't think I have this on the screen, but Exodus chapter 16, this takes place after, the, um, after they've been brought out of Egypt. God just rescued them. Everything had transpired with that. But this is before the Sabbath had actually been made a thing. Um, so this is in between those, those times. Um, and the people complained. They grumbled, saying, you're not giving us any food. We're going to starve to death. Oh, I wish we were in the I Egypt where it was all great and wonderful. Um, totally misremembering. Um, and he, Moses says, the Lord said to Moses in verse 4, um, I will rain down bread from heaven for you, and the people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. In this way, I will test them and see whether they will follow my instructions. On the six days, they are to prepare what they bring in, and that is to be twice as much as they gather on all the other days. Um, and so God makes this, even though he hasn't commanded the Sabbath, Ten Commandments aren't a thing yet, any of that, He's kind of putting it in their daily lives to get ready the habit of having the Sabbath. And we're going to talk about why the Sabbath is a big deal. Um, and I would say this, even the manna has a, uh, and the Sabbath, but also in this case, the manna has something that transpires and goes back to Genesis chapter 1. Um, and many people have pointed this out, but uh, when in days one through five of creation, God says good, and this is God providing manna. Day six, um, God provides double manna. Uh, some say that qualified, that go, corresponds to very good, and then both have the Sabbath rest. And so even in the story of this story leading up to Sabbath, it has a something that connects back to um, the seventh day and the day of creation. But then you actually get into the Sabbath. Um, and we're going to look at a couple of passages when they're first introduced. But just in kind of your knowledge of the Sabbath, what would you say is one of the reasons or just some good logic for why God would make this special day for the Israelites to um, remember and to consecrate every single week? Why did he make the Sabbath a thing? Yeah, so it was a weekly reminder of him. Good. Well. Yeah, you, you cease all your other stuff that can so easily fill up your life. And you say, I'm taking this day and I'm worshiping God. I'm spending time with God. Good. Yes. Any other thoughts? Yeah, um, and I, I think this is a, it's supposed to be a gift from God. Um, this is, so like other, um, I think I have it in here somewhere, that so many other pagan religions at that day had a day to celebrate the day in which God, the God they worship, whether Molech or Baal or whatever that was, came to reside in the temple. They had a special day for that. And during the day, they would have to make it all about the God, bring the produce for the God and whatnot. What God does is he made a special day for to commemorate when he came into his temple. But instead of making it all about himself necessarily, he wanted and making them work for him. He made it for all of Israel to come and just rest, come into his rest and enjoyment and stuff like that. Um, and I think that's that's really really cool. Any other thoughts? Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. Why, why is it important to, to break the routine every once in a while? Yeah, get fresh eyes, good. You have thoughts? It's just like, it's so easy to be caught up in stuff. I, I don't know if you know this, like, have you ever been worked for like, you know, I don't know, six months in a row, a year in a row, and they finally take a vacation, and then you go back to work, and it was like, how did I ever do this? Like, and like how did I ever get in this routine? And it just kind of frees you up. Um, and you do, sometimes don't even know how down and worked down you were until you had that rest to actually see I needed some, some help. Um, here's a couple of passages that talk about why the, the Sabbath was made. So in Exodus 20, verse 8 and 11, it says, Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor, do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall do, not do any work, neither you, your son, your daughter, your male or female servants, your, nor your animals, nor your foreigner, foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath and made it holy. So what is the reason that in, in Exodus that he made the Israelites rest. Yeah, because he rested, and he wants you to join into it, like, and, and to celebrate it. Now, I, the, the reason I make that point is because in Deuteronomy, it, the same command is given. So this is the exact same command that is given all the way through here, but they give a different reason. So verse 15, it says, remember, so rest, don't do any work. Verse 15, remember that you were slaves in Egypt and that the Lord your God brought you out there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. So why does he command them to rest in Deuteronomy? Why is the Sabbath a thing there? Yeah, it's as a remembrance of, yeah. And in Egypt, they were slaves. Did you get any rest when you were a slave? No. And you just worked and worked and worked. Very much so. Yeah. Totally, totally agree. I think it is God assigned that. I think this is one of the things, like almost all of God's laws, all of God's laws, it's good for us. He doesn't just say, do it because he wants to make another rule. It's good for us to take a break from working and normal day-to-day -day life stuff um, and, and, and to really think about that kind of stuff. Um, now, is it always convenient to do this, to observe the Sabbath? Was it always convenient for Jews to observe the Sabbath? Why? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Yes. 100%. It's a it's a it's an act of faith, because my neighbor's not doing that. You know, my canine neighbor's he's not resting. He's going to get ahead. He's going to make more money. He's going to you know be able to buy more. And and, and you kind of get we even get this in America where you you're always trying to compete, and so you're always working more and more and more and more to try to keep up with whoever is in life. And God said no. 
rest. And in fact, in Exodus uh, chapter 31, verses 12 through 17, when he gives this command again, he says, if you do not rest on the Sabbath, you're killed. Like, you're stoned. That's, that's the, the consequence. So it's a way of, like, I'm going to make you rest. I'm going to make you take a day off once a week. If you don't, it's, 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 it's a punishment. And I don't think that's just so you take a rest, but it's also the faith thing that you rely on me, which will be even more explained later on. Any, any other thoughts? We're about to get to that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Very good. You're tracking. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Yeah. So I, I put it in here. I think we should inconvenience. I think God had Israel inconvenience. You know, if I was a Jew, inconvenience my life for one day in a weekly rhythm to remind myself that my life and my time is not my own, but it's under the rule and the privilege of God. Um, I think that's one of the reasons that he put it. We are meant to stop and realize that I will not die if I don't work every single day, but instead I put my trust in God and God's abundance that he will provide that there is enough, and that he is a good God. I think this also t- kind of ties to Jesus' uh, teachings on the Sermon on the Mount about anxiety and worry. I think it all comes back to, like, you should learn these lessons through this Sabbath keeping. Um, and if you don't, you're being put to death. Any, anything else on the Sabbath before we go to the other festivals? Yes. No, you're good. You're good. You're tracking. It's good. Um, I'm kind of going chronologically throughout the Bible. Okay, so we talked about that. Um, so the point of festivals. Um, just go ahead and turn to Leviticus because we'll be in Leviticus for, uh, for just a little bit. Um, I had a whole section on this. I don't think I'm going to actually spend a bunch of time on this. But if you just kind of scan through Leviticus chapter 23... This is the main uh, place where there's all the festivals. So if you want, you want to ever find out you know, what Pentecost is, what uh, the Day of Atonement is, what the Festival of the Trumpets is, all that kind of stuff, that's here, all here in chapter 23. Um, and what, what's interesting, so there's seven of them. One is the Sabbath, and the other three are two lists of three. The other six are two lists of three. Where have we seen that before? Um, that's the, the, the creation days. Um, and what I would remark is that through each one of those, they're called a day of Sabbath. They're supposed to, whatever they may be, so it's the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Um, this is to, what is the Passover? I'll make you do it. Say it. What is the Passover commemorating? Yep, and they're, yeah, freedom from the land. And so it's, it's a day in which they are, in the past, they had to work, and now God is giving them rest from that type of work. Um, and what they're supposed to do is they're supposed to celebrate um, for seven days afterwards um, the, the, the unleavened bread, which is conjoined to the Passover, um, and then it's a day of rest after hard labor, and um, it should be a day of rest for them. It's a Sabbath day for them. And every one of these is a rest, a time of rest. So the Feast of the First Fruits is supposed to be a day after the Sabbath. You take your first fruits in, and it's supposed to be a day of rest. And the Pentecost, um, during that entire time, you're supposed to uh, take a day of rest, the day after the Sabbath, so on that Sunday. It's supposed to be a, a Sabbath and take a day of rest. Trumpets, it's supposed to be a day of rest. Day of atonement, it's supposed to be a day of rest. Tabernacles, um, that's to relive the wilderness wanderings. Um, it's also called the day of booths. Where seven days, you camp out um, and you cover your, it says literally you, you cover your, your tents with the leaves that grow up from trees next to a river, kind of tying in the image of Eden back. 
And it says you are to not re- you are to rest and do no work. All of these are to like the same thing. Everything that we said about the Sabbath day weekly, it's even more these days. These are six other days in which you are supposed to just rest, and you're supposed to, and sometimes take a whole week to just party and enjoy one another's company and to remember the times in which God has. Um, saved you and, and helped your people. And I, I think this is really good for people to do, just taking time to rest and be with people and remember what God has done for them. So that's what I have for those festivals. We'll get into the, we're, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the festival weeks um, or the, the seventh year and the year Jubilee. But any, anything else on the appointed festivals? Um, so you have weekly reminders to rest. You have um, six times a, a, a week or a year that you do special times of rest. And then you also have yearly rest. So if you turn over a page um, or two uh, in Leviticus chapter 25, it talks about this Sabbath year. So it's a whole year in which you are to rest. Um, so um, let's, let's start in verse 3. Uh, let's start in verse 2. Uh, speak to the Israelites and say to them, When you enter the land I give, I'm going to give to you, the land itself may ob- must observe a Sabbath to the Lord. So not only are people to observe the Sabbath, the land is to observe a, a Sabbath here. For six years sow your fields, for six years prune your vineyards, and gather their crops. But in the seventh year... The land is to have a year of Sabbath rest, a Sabbath to the Lord. Do not sow your fields or prune your vineyards. Do not reap what, do not reap what grows of itself or harvest and the grapes you in undetent, yeah, and grapes of your unintended vines. The land is to have a year of rest. Whatever the land yields during the Sabbath year will be your food for you, for yourself, for your male and female servants, the hired worker, the temporary resident who lived among you, as well as for your livestock, the wild animals in your land, whatever the land produces may be eaten. So what do you think about this? Would this be hard to do? Why would it be hard to do? Okay, yeah. Yeah, so you could do some some of that storage, um, and in fact, he he says later on that he will. If you do this, the sixth year is just going to be a massive year where he will make it three harvest work. So yeah, good. Good question. Yeah, because like, how much of your time is dedicated to working and survival? So what do you do for a full year? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Austin? Yes. Yes. And we would know this as good for the land just in general because we know that knowledge now. Um, so I, so people have debated whether this was like a year of everyone doing this at the same time or if it's just, you know, six years or seven years after you receive the land or every seven years, you personal, your property, you do this. I, I think it's the latter. I think it's on an individual basis, not a nation ba- basis where for seven years, every seventh year you've had that property, you give it a rest. And it is good for the land and whatnot, um, but yeah, it, it, you're supposed to do that. Yes, go ahead. This, this Jubilee year is kind of a reset. Yes. If they sold the land, the Jubilee year, it went back to the original owner. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yes, yeah. Because they stopped doing it, and really, on Marty, she went into captivity. Yeah, so, they, so every seven years, they were supposed to not work the land. And then it, it says, so how will you survive? Well, it says, whatever the land produces, you eat. Which is very much on the faith thing again. Like, okay, God, what are we having today? <laughs> um, but every seventh, seventh, so you would do um, that seven times. So every 49th year, you would do the same thing. Um, you would, so the 49th year, you would do your normal seven. But after that seventh, seventh, that 50th year, you will do what Jimmy is talking about, which is the year of Jubilee. So the 50th year, it says in verse 11, it shall be a Jubilee for you. Do not sow, do not reap what grows itself or the harvest um, and the intended vines for the year is Jubilee and holy for you. He only was taken directly from the field. And like uh, Jimmy says, there's a, a reset. And what are the three things that are, are reset during a Jubilee year? Your land, your land, land goes back to the original owner. Slaves are free. Debt, and your debt is forgiven. So it's a total reset, like Jimmy said, back to the original. Can you put yourself in the situation of an Israelite. What would it look like to have this Jubilee year? Yeah, why would it be awesome? Yeah. So, like, if you're, you're a hard time, a famine, something your dad, in your dad's lifetime, that gets passed. You have to sell your land. You don't get your inheritance. Tough luck. But you're like, it's only 10 more years. There's a jubilee year, and then we get our property back. We get our life back. Because if you didn't have land, you couldn't support yourself, you couldn't have harvest, and you couldn't be it. Or if a debt, you got a massive debt, and you're working hard, you know, five more years, I get free of this debt. Five more years. Can you imagine what that would do to your, your psyche and to, like, people in, in, in Israel? Um, it would be, it'd be really, because this only happens once in a person's lifetime, really. It could happen twice, but it'd be like once when you're a kid, once when you're really old. But for probably most people, this would happen once in everybody's lifetime. What about the people who bought that land and now Well, they would have their original land that they were given, no matter who they were. You see, like, because they would still be given the original land. But, yeah. I'm just curious, I mean, how all that would have worked out. Yeah. Because, yeah, so it stops monopolies is what it does. Yeah. It stops somebody gaining a bunch of wealth and then eventually becoming king and everything that comes from that is what it does. Um, and it, it, it goes back to everyone is equal. Everyone is the same. Everyone's going to do the same. And the person who had all that money and cumulative, I mean, the, yes, they lost a bunch of their assets, but they were in a pretty good position to be able to accumulate those assets. So, yes, and they knew it was coming. Yeah. They knew it was coming. It's not like something like, surprise, roll the dice. It's the 50th year, Jubilee. Yeah. Yeah. It's every kind of 50th year. Yeah. I think we would think of it more in terms of a lease for a set number of years. Yeah. Yeah. And like, isn't this all just a lease from God anyway? Like, I, I think that's what also this is for supposed to make you do. This isn't my land, really. This is God's land. God gave me this land. And so if the, you know, God wants me to give it back every 50th year, then that's his prerogative. Right. 
Right. Yes. Yep. It would be. Yeah, I am not getting through most of this. Man. <sighs> okay. So there is consequences to this. So you can see from all of this, what is God trying to do? He's trying to give Israel a rest. He's trying to, like, give them just a little taste of what it was supposed to be like in Eden. And it, this isn't God trying to be, okay, you know, you, you got to take one day off, and you just got to do nothing, and you just got to look at blank walls, and that's your, your punishment. No, he's trying to give them a chance to rest and do what, the, what was originally supposed to happen. And he says, like, if you do good, then um, things will go great. And verse 26, in chapter 26, I will look on favor on you, uh, make you fruitful, increase your numbers, and I'll keep my covenant with you. And you will still be eating the last year's harvest when you have, have to move it out to make room for the new. I will put my dwelling place among you, and I will not abhor you. I will walk among you and be your God, and you will be my people. What does that sound like? Especially the, I will walk among you. It's Eden. He's trying to get them to live in like a little Eden. But of course, there is the bad. If you don't do this, I'm going to scatter you. Um, your land will be waste. Your cities will lie in ruin. That the land will enjoy its Sabbath years and all the time that it lies desolate. And you're the country for your enemies. And then the land will rest, enjoy its Sabbath. And all the time it lies desolate. The land will have rest. It did not have during the Sabbath you lived in it. So he says, you know, if you don't do it, this is what's going to happen. This is just one of the many curses. Of course, did the Israel ever observe the year of Jubilee? We have no record that Israel ever observed the year of Jubilee or any of the seven years. Um, and so what happens to them? They get destroyed. And then you have this, this verse in St. Chronicles. This is looking back after they've been taken captivity and they've come back from exile. And they're given a recount of the history. And he said, he carried into exile the Babylonian, the remnant, um, who escaped from the sword. And they became the servants of him and his successors until the kingdom of Persia came to power. And the land had joined its Sabbath rest. All the time of its desolation, it rested until the 70 years were completed in the fulfillment of the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah. Jeremiah. So it says, like, I, this is the reason for the rest. And you didn't give a rest. You didn't do this. And so you're going to have to suffer. And so you, you're still looking for the rest. Um, and I'll end here. You have a Isaiah speaking, and he says, um, in Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim the captive, freedom from the captives, and to release the darkness for, for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. In the day of vengeance of our Lord, our God, to comfort all who mourn. The year of the Lord's favor is the year of Jubilee. And he says, speaking of someone that will come um, in the Spirit, will declare the year of Jubilee and do all of these great things. Uh, give you a hint of who that is. Um, and so we'll pick up there real quick next, next week. Um, and then we'll do Genesis chapter 2.